raise mu money for our community projects, our swimming pool and our ball leagues. How much uh, do you expect to raise by this project? Oh, 10,000. Eight to ten, probably. We put it back into our old home here, the Marks House, and we redecorate it and paint and keep up with the work on it. This is our 16th annual one, and we get good response, and we have people backing for our sweet shop and turning in a lot. We have a hospitality room where we have the biscuits and sausage and cheese and everything. We just have a good response, and we enjoy this annual event. The Alabama Black Mayors Conference drew people from many fields other than politics. Educators, businessmen, church and civic leaders were also among those who came to heal the wounds of Tuesday's elections. Tuskegee Mayor Johnny Ford says that's the first step toward progress. Well, there's no question about it. The elections are over. One of the things that we must learn to do uh, is not get personal about politics. Uh, politics uh, is a way of, of getting elected to office and there's no reason at all, at all for our community to be divided permanently because we had some differences during the political uh, contest. Now the problem that we've had is that the system has educated us in a way to frustrate and to prevent us from making money. One major goal for black leaders during the next four years is clearly a strong economic base for blacks. We're talking about working together, developing a common strategy so that blacks in this state will be able to help themselves and to be de develop their own resources so that we will be able to, to, to have a meaningful role in the society. Mayor Ford called this an amiable meeting, designed far more for looking at the prospects of the future than at the problems of the past. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News in Tuskegee. I haven't said anything until this time because I didn't feel it was time to say anything. I didn't have anything to report. But uh, I can tell you that the conspiracy involves something very deep, including attempted murder. And I reported to the district attorney of Madison County, and they did not investigate an attempted murder when my airplane was sabotaged in, uh, in Huntsville. And uh, some very strange things have happened the, in the FAA. Uh, I couldn't get an investigation of a sabotage my airplane. Uh, from the Federal Aviation Administration. As I was in contact with a black attorney in Atlanta named Thomas, and all of a sudden he disappeared. So um, these are the many things that uh, have been happening. Those, those are just two of the things that have happened. So the Alabama Conference of Black Mayors, who some of them are quite familiar with some of the tricks that they have been pulling on me, uh, they wish to get to the bottom of this situation because it seems like it's quite a one-sided situation. I can also say that uh, so far as my uh, alleged guilty plea is concerned, that, that was done on the behalf, that was done by my attorney at the time. And uh, he rushed me into this thing. I, uh, I originally told him I, want, I didn't want to play, I wanted to plead no contest. And uh, he said that wasn't allowable. But I said, okay, well, it is obvious to me that the, uh, that the main witness in this particular case, or the person who's responsible for this problem, is trying to throw us off on me as a former employee of mine. And this uh, employee of mine who's involved in a great fraud, uh, trying to defraud me of considerable amounts of sums of money and property, uh, was the chief witness against me in New York and actually used perjured testimony against me in New York. 
So uh, we are going to get to the bottom of it, and I'm very happy that my friends in the Alabama Black Mayor's Conference have taken my side in this situation. And I think that the public is entitled to know the things that are done on, supposedly in their name, by people who are elected officials who will not discharge their duty properly. I mean, it's definitely a conspiracy against me. The whole thing is because some people in Huntsville wanted my property. That's exactly what the situation was. The photographs tell the story of hard times, Alabama during the Great Depression. In 1932, cotton dropped to its lowest price ever, five cents a pound. Five cent cotton became a symbol for how bad things were in Alabama. Many of the photographs are simply called sharecropper. During the Depression, most cotton farmers were landless, working soil that belonged to a landlord. An Alabama poet wrote the sharecropper's prayer. From dawn to dark, from can till can't, ain't no way a man can come out. These photographs were used to convince the public that the federal government should help rule America and later to document New Deal programs. Marianne Neely of the Landmarks Foundation says the photographs have become a valuable historical record. Still photograph can tell us a great deal about a condition at a certain time, a person, uh, the person's personality. I also think they're art in that they capture the essence of a person as well as his physical being and in their eyes, I think particularly in these photographs, you can see something of the human condition and can relate it not only to that period but to other periods of history as well. Susan Silvernail, WSFA TV News. The Georgia Bulldogs had only lost once to the Florida Gators in the past eight years. Today was to be no different. In the first quarter, with the score tied nothing nothing, the amazing Herschel Walker on a 30-yard touchdown run, breaking tackles at the goal line, Georgia took a 7-0 lead. In the second quarter, with the score 7-0, Georgia, Walker goes over again as he takes the handoff and just leaps over the plane of the end zone. The Bulldogs go in front 14-0. The Georgia defense was also awesome this afternoon. On fourth and goal from the one, Florida's Lorenzo Rankin is stopped by the Bulldog defense. But the game belonged to Herschel Walker. He rushed for 221 yards on 35 carries, 24 coming on this sideline jaunt. Walker appears to be headed for the Heisman Trophy. All eyes today were glued on Herschel Walker. He scored his third touchdown of the game in the third quarter. Georgia took a 27-0 lead. They went on to win. 44 nothing. I'm Michael Stone for NBC News. There is a temptation to begin this report with the words ho-hum. After seven days of talks at the Summit Hotel in New York, players and owners are still $110 million apart for the 1983 season, $95 million for 1984. The players say that even if the owners give them all the money they want, football will still be one of the most profitable businesses in America. The owners say they'll lose $24 million in 1983 alone. And so on and so forth. The players say they want a full 16-game season if the strike ends. The owners say fewer. There is a temptation to end this report with the words ho-hum. Eric Burns, NBC News, New York. Former Miami Dolphins running back Eugene Mercury Morris stood and faced the jury as the verdict was read. By the defendant, Eugene Edward Morris, as to count to trafficking in cocaine, guilty of trafficking in cocaine. The jury deliberated three hours before finding Morris guilty of three drug charges and innocent of two. He showed no reaction to the verdict. Outside the courtroom, Morris's lawyer, Ron Strauss, said he'll appeal the decision. My reaction is it would be the same as Gene's. I don't think justice was done. I think it ultimately will be done. 
Assistant State Attorney George Yaw said the verdict should serve as a warning. What the jury told Gene Morris and other people who were involved in the cocaine business is that you can't do it. In the early 1970s, Morris was a star player for the Dolphins, assisting the team in two Super Bowl victories. The former outstanding football player will be sentenced on January 20th. He faces a minimum, mandatory 15-year prison term for the cocaine trafficking conviction alone. After the trial, Morris was led to the county jail. Shauna Singletary, NBC News, Miami. She was my business manager, and she was in charge of all office procedures, and she told a lie, said our relationship was entirely personal. It's obviously a lie, because everybody knows this, that this person was completely and totally in charge of my whole office system. As a matter of fact, he set up a new system in which she was the one that got those checks out of the mail. So you're saying to us that you had no knowledge that those checks were being cashed? I am not saying that I had no knowledge of it. I didn't have any knowledge until she skipped out. Whose signature, out of my property. Whose signatures appeared on those checks? Uh, I don't know. I don't know whose signature appeared on most of them. Did you ever sign any after uh, after your mother passed away? I am not going to answer that. I, I don't think that has anything to do with the situation right now. We're going to find all that out in court. And, but, but another thing that I must say, too, is that uh, it's rather unusual that uh, I can't get a trial. I want a trial. I, I'm entitled to it. And there's such a thing as due process of law. And what they seem to be trying to do is to keep me from being able to tell my story. And that's exactly what I'm saying. By who, who are you referring to? Who am I referring to? Yes. The, oh, well, it's, I say it's a, it's a conspiracy on the part probably of uh, certain elected officials. I can imagine that there's a dist the district attorney's office is very nervous about this situation because, after all, attempted murder is attempted murder. And it was reported, I directly reported this to the district attorney of Madison County myself. And there has been absolutely no investigation. I mean, an attempted murder is something that... Uh, uh, has no statute of limitations, and I think you'll also find that there's a doctrine, a precedent in the court system that says that when a person's, uh, when an attempt has been made on a person's life, and that uh, there seems to be no remedy through uh, through uh, the uh, routine legal procedures through the uh, public uh, f facilities, say like the district attorney's office or attorney general's office, then that person has a right to do anything that is necessary to see to it that justice is going to take place. And I am doing just exactly that. I don't know if that includes uh, the right for me to go find the guilty party who sabotaged my airplane and made the attempt on my life and blowing his brains out on the courthouse steps. But if it comes to that, I think we may, we may see that. But I, un I understand from a certain doctrine that I'm entitled to do anything that's necessary to protect my life when the, when the state of Alabama and the federal government will not protect me. We knew that the economy would be the number one issue. Uh, I've said that since early summer. Uh, I've seen some good friends uh, go down the drain, so to speak. Uh, I've seen some others that uh, I didn't think would uh, be tarred by the, the brush of uh, Reaganomics, and they've gone down too. Uh, it, it's been a, an, an unusual election. 
Uh, Peggy Heckle, for, Heckler, for instance, from uh, Boston, uh, she's pretty liberal, and she certainly hadn't been in, in the Reagan camp uh, consistently, but she lost. Uh, I don't know, it's, it's a strange election, and it just went from state to state or district to district, depending on the personality quite often. Do you think this will perhaps change the course instead of stay the course? Oh, yes. Yeah, I, w I would think so. Um, I think to a very large extent, uh, the votes that were picked up will not be supportive of uh, the, this administration. And, uh, and I think that's unfortunate because I think it, we're on the right course. We're swinging in the right direction. And uh, we've only been on it like 21 months. It took us several years to get in the shape we were in. But I think we, the, the new people coming into the Congress are going to feel a mandate to change the course and direction that this government is taking of this administration. I think it's unfortunate. I think it, we'll all lose by it because when you take interest rates that have gone from 20.5% to 11.5% in 20 months, uh, inflation has gone from like 15% down to 4%. Uh, this, this is what we need, and this, the, the employment part of it has to catch up later. And to throw it out now and say, hey, let's go back to something like, like we were when Carter, I don't, believe it, I don't believe it was anybody that would consciously vote to go back to the way things were under President Carter with 20.5% inflation, I mean interest, and 15% inflation. The Supreme Court ruled Friday Alabama Power has a right to earn at least 15% return on equity, and the court gave Alabama Power and the Public Service Commission three and a half weeks to agree upon a dollar figure. Company spokesman Chris Conway says that amount will probably exceed the $325 million rate hike originally requested in 1981, a request the PSC denied. The decision of the Supreme Court is going to mean that the customers will have a rate increase and it will, they will have it beginning December the 1st. Now just how much that rate increase is going to be, we don't know yet until we have a chance to see what the Commission does. The what it will probably mean is an increase of about $8 a month on the average residential customer's bill for 1,000 kilowatts of power. It might also mean the power company will stop asking for so many increases. I think it may mean uh, that with a good responsible order uh, based on this decision, we will not be back before the Commission as frequently or for as much if we can get on our feet, so to speak, and get out of the financial hole. The power company, the PSC, and several intervenors are also working once again on a plan for regular reviews and adjustments of power company earnings. If such a plan is approved, power company officials say it might do away with the, quote, sledgehammer effect of sudden rate increases. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. But I think we, the, the new people coming into the Congress are going to feel a mandate to change the course and direction that this government is taking of this administration. I think it's unfortunate. I think it, we'll all lose by it. Because when you take interest rates that have gone from 20.5% to 11.5% in 20 months, uh, inflation has gone from like 15% down to 4%. Uh, this, this is what we need, and this, the, the employment part of it has to catch up later. And to throw it out now and say, hey, let's go back to something like, like we were when Carter, I don't, believe it, I don't believe it was anybody that would consciously vote to go back to the way things were under President Carter with 20.5% inflation, I mean interest, and 15% inflation. And uh, I don't think it, uh, that the average voter viewed it in, in this perspective. How is this going to affect the Republicans in the House now? 
With a few exceptions, like posing for photographers and the Charlie Daniels music, the key word today was authenticity. For this group of history buffs, nothing short of donning exact copies of all wool Civil War uniforms on a warm fall day will do. Commanding Officer Stephen McKinney doesn't think Hollywood has done history any favors. Often movie actors will wear polyester uniforms, he says. We don't allow anything to be carried or worn that's not authentic. We do that, we cheapen the hobby for ourselves and for the public. The public deserves, as do ourselves, the opportunity to see exactly what the Confederate and Federal soldiers wore and used during the Civil War. So the Mach 15th Alabama Infantry considers as part of its mission to show youngsters the real uniforms, weapons that were made during the war, a true Confederate campsite, and cooking soldier style, including Confederate crackers. This is the hard-packed bread that was eaten by the Confederate uh, soldiers and the Union soldiers also. For the public's benefit, the Confederates met the Yankees on a battlefield once again. Authenticity aside, the rifles contained only black powder. McKinney says he gets a lot of satisfaction turning back the pages in a history book for a few minutes. He, like others in today's outing, has ancestors who fought in the Civil War. He laughs when he says one even fought on the Union side. I suggest one problem with these staged battles. McKinney says plenty of his friends are willing to take up arms for the Confederacy, but it seems he has a hard time recruiting men to play the part of Yankee soldiers. Susan Silvernail, WSFA TV News. Well, we hope we can translate this information into our work in Western Germany and uh, then we perform a better instruction work in the adult education centers uh, which are provided by local authorities. Lionel James, leading punt returner in the Southeastern Conference, finally ignited a sluggish Auburn offense with this great punt return late in the first quarter. Al Del Greco then kicked Auburn ahead 3-0, the first of three field goals on the day. Bo Jackson got on track in the second quarter, breaking a 53-yard run down the sidelines to set up Auburn's first touchdown. Randy Campbell then tossed Auburn into the end zone on third and goal. Beautiful catch by Mike Edwards. Auburn 10, Rutgers nothing. Campbell threw the air again to Mike Edwards. 33 yards to the Rutgers 30. Five plays from there, Bo Jackson dived into the end zone. Bo had 114 yards on the day. 15 carries, one touchdown. A confident builder for number 34. Lyle James doing his punt returning magic in the third quarter. All the way down to the Rutgers 16 yard line where Del Greco kicked the field goal to make it 20 nothing. All the while the Auburn defense was playing its usual solid football. Greg Tut picking off the Scarlet Knight pass. The visitors did not reach Auburn territory until the middle of the fourth quarter when the game was over. Randy Campbell capped the Auburn offensive show passing to Chris Wood, who made the great run after the catch to answer Rutgers' only touchdown of the day. Auburn has nailed down some kind of a bowl game with today's win. They are 72 on the year after the 30-7 victory and still in the race for the conference crown. This is Phil Snow reporting from Auburn.
both defenses slugged it out in the first quarter, and it was midway through the second before LSU got going. Alan Risher hits ball from Hilliard here. He breaks several tackles and rambles 33 yards to the Bama 29. Hilliard caps the 90-yard march, going 16 yards around left end for the score. 7-0 LSU, 8-10 left in the first half. The tight offense was battling all the day. They didn't get a first down in the first half, and two turnovers led to quick Tiger scores right before half. The first here when Joe Carter loses it after a seven-yard run. After driving to the tie three, Risher fakes up the middle and fires to Malcolm Scott in the corner of the end zone. 14-0 LSU. Disaster strikes Bama again on the ensuing kickoff. Craig Turner can't find the handle. LSU has it at the tie 28. They drive it to the seven, and Juan Bistanzos boots this 23-yard field goal. LSU surprisingly ahead of Alabama, 17-0 at half. The Tide got it going in the third after a Peter Kim field goal made it 17-3. Alabama gets a break. Hilliard's popped here after a short pass. Al Blue recovers at the Tiger 28. On the next play, Walter Lewis drops back and fires a strike to Joey Jones for the touchdown. Just like that, Bama's right back in at 17-10. But from there, the Tide offense just couldn't dent the LSU defense. After a field goal made it 20-10, the Tide mounted a mid-fourth quarter charge, but Walter Lewis is sacked here on the blitz. He fumbles, LSU recovers, and the Tide never did. 20-10, the final LSU over Alabama. The Tigers improved to 7-0-1, 4-0-1 in the SEC. Bama falls to 7-2, 3-2 in the conference. Auburn's sluggish offense was ignited late in the first quarter when the SEC's leading punt returner, Lionel James, hauls in this kick at his own 30, heads toward the left sideline, picks up some good blocks, and goes 49 yards down to the Rutgers 16. That set up an El Del Greco field goal, and the Tigers were rolling. Midway through the second, Auburn got their first TD as Randy Campbell connects here with Chris Woods from eight yards out, 10-0 Auburn. When Bo Jackson scored on this four-yard run, Auburn led it 17-0 in halftime. With the score 23-7, the Tigers pleased the homecoming crowd as Campbell connects here with Woods for a 57-yard fourth-quarter touchdown. Auburn beats Rutgers 30-7. Next week, it's the SEC showdown with Georgia on the Plains. For the Auburn-Rutgers game on the Auburn Football Review, following tonight's Tennessee report. LSU scored 17 unanswered second quarter points to put away Alabama. Freshman Dalton Hilliard capped a 90 yard drive with this bruising 16 yard touchdown run to put the Tigers on the board. After an Alabama fumble deep in tie territory, quarterback Allen Risher nails Malcolm Scott with his four yard score to make it a 14 0 game. On the ensuing kickoff, Greg Turner can't make the catch in the crowd. The Tigers recover the loose ball. They drive for a field goal 17 0 LSU at halftime. Looked like Bama would bounce back in the third after a Peter Kim field goal and a Tiger fumble. Walter Lewis connects here with Joey Jones for a 28-yard touchdown pass. And the Tide had scored 10 points in 28 seconds to cut it to 17-10. But the day belonged to the LSU defense. Alabama could muster only 119 yards of total offense. And when Walter Lewis is sacked here, the Tide lost their fourth fumble of the day, along with all hopes of an SEC championship. 20-10, LSU wins it. Alabama tries to regroup next Saturday in Tuscaloosa against Southern Mississippi.
fixed. We have main engine ignition. When Columbia takes off on its fifth mission, it will be manned by four astronauts and supported by thousands of people on the ground, including a growing number of women. And now it's time to get down to business and space. This fifth One of those women of is Columbia Doris Chandler, is a senior systems engineer at Huntsville's Marshall Space Flight Center. Ms. Chandler came to Montgomery today to tell a civic group about some uh, of the projects S1C, coming up for the shuttle. S2. But her appearance was also evidence in of the growing importance of women in the space program. A few years ago, maybe you saw an isolated woman. Uh, now, with the new, uh, some new people we're beginning to pick up at Marshall, we're getting many, many more women, and uh, the attitude, you know, has completely changed, I think. It's just sort of taken for granted now. That it, uh, Ms. Chandler once wanted to be an astronaut herself, but the, she couldn't pass uh, the physical. However, other women have, and she says it won't be long before women in space are common. The Soviet Union has already put female cosmonauts into orbit, but American women won't join the race in space until Shuttle Flight 7 next year. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News. The jurors will have to consider these things. Did Bryce officials release David Candidate knowing he would kill again? And was that release the cause of death of Felix Richardson? That's essentially what the plaintiffs have charged. The other side of the coin, the defense says Candidate was released after he showed he could be trusted to take his medicine, medicine that controlled his anger and violent acts. The defense also said it is quite possible that David Candidate was simply mean and used the mental illness plea to cover up the acts of violence. The 12 jurors will also have to consider the testimony of several expert witnesses called by both sides over the past two weeks and hundreds of pages of medical documents submitted by both sides. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA TV News at the Montgomery County Courthouse. The story of Jim and Marianne is a success story that's still in the making. Ten years ago, they invested $30,000 in a rundown farm in Baldwin County. The dream was to grow grapes for the Bartell Winery in Florida. But in 1979, the owner of Bartell's died and the winery closed. With a crop ready for harvest, the Edens had no place to take it. That's when they entered the wine making business. But before the winery got off the ground, they needed money winemaking consultants, and even a law passed by the legislature. We've nurtured every one of the 7,000 little darlings from the time we put their roots in the ground in 1971 and 1972. And uh, the thought of losing the farm, or the prospect of losing the farm, is what made us move the mountains that we moved. Now the husband and wife team is traveling Alabama promoting their wine, and of course the wine industry in the state. While theirs is the only licensed winery in Alabama, Mary Ann says there's room for competition. If we import or we sell four million gallons of wine in this state every year, and Perdido Vineyards is only producing 30,000 gallons of it right now, that's a, pardon the pun, it's a drop in the bucket. Wine growing is a risky business. After 10 years, they're still looking to turn a profit. While they want to expand and have a market to sell more wine, the Edens can't find financial backing to enlarge their operation. The prospects of making money may have gotten them into the winemaking business, but Marianne readily admits she likes the lifestyle. I have a very hard time placing you in the category of the little old winemaker. <laughs> Do other people have the same problem? Don't you watch Falcon Crest? <laughs> Don Phelps, WSFA TV News. Oh, the winemakers are in that program and the gender of... of uh...
Splitting and we'll have a splitting and running, a quick out, a quick slam, a quick post. We'll be Rick, we hope we've uh, got a good chance. We at this stage everybody that's in the playoffs has an equal chance. It's a one and out tournament. Uh, so we think our chances are as good as any. We like to always think that we have an opportunity to win the state championship if we can get in. Uh, we're not real sure how our loss against Meridian last week will affect us. The boys that are playing for Jeff Davis, even the seniors that have been here three years, have never lost a football game since they've been at Jeff Davis and had to come back and play the next week. And we're not real sure how they're going to... Uh, uh, this how it'll affect them if they'll come back and have a fighting spirit if they want to roll over and play dead. The Vols were knocked from the ranks of the Invincible Thursday night, losing to Mississippi's top-ranked team, Meridian High School. It was the first regular season loss for Jeff Davis in two years. Coach Charles Lee doesn't like the fact that his team lost, especially with the first round of the State 4A playoffs coming up this Friday. But he says it could be a blessing in disguise. The thing we're trying to do is sell our players on the fact that we did not play well. We had not played well in games that we had won, and we hope that uh, their pride and, and uh, that they have in themselves and their football team will help them to, to overcome and, and do better than what they've been doing. J.D. hosts Birmingham's West End High School this Friday night in the first round of the playoffs. The Wildcats are 7-3 and three and got into the playoffs as a wild card team. But Lee says that's no reason to take them lightly. They've been in the playoffs probably more than any 4A team in the state. Uh, West End is probably one of the most respected teams in the Birmingham area in the state. Uh, they are perennial winners. Uh, their, their offense is uh, different, it's uh, very sound, but it's different from what we're accustomed to seeing and it, it poses a lot of problems for our defense. What kind of game can we look for Friday night? West End is extremely strong, extremely well coached. They make very few errors. Uh, they are a ball control team. We don't expect them to beat us or us to beat them very much. We expect it to be primarily a low scoring ball game with an awful lot of defense being played. Jeff Davis and West End in the first round of the 4A playoffs. Kickoff Friday night at Crampton Bowl is 7.30. The deliberations began after a full morning of final arguments from both sides in the case and jury instructions from Judge Sam Taylor. The panel met for approximately three and a half hours before being sent home for the night by Judge Taylor and told to return to the jury room tomorrow morning. Lawyers for the family of Felix Richardson charged that Bryce officials released David Candidate knowing he was dangerous and the release caused the death of Richardson. Defense attorneys countered that by saying they obeyed the law in releasing Candidate and did that only after determining the mental patient would receive outpatient care and observation in Montgomery. The jury will continue to review these issues tomorrow morning. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA TV News reporting. Very kind of you to have me here, and don't worry, I'm not going to talk about any of those papers. As for their booster development, the uh, S1C and Houston now controlling mission control confirmed. I think a few years ago, maybe you saw an isolated woman. Uh, now, with the new, uh, some new people we're beginning to pick up at Marshall, we're getting many, many more women, and uh, the attitude, you know, has completely changed. January 5th, 1982. Montgomery police officer Mary McCord was shot to death during an attempted drug arrest in West Montgomery. Her partner, Tony Burks, was critically wounded. He survived. 14-year-old John Bunky Thompson wasn't so lucky. He and 16-year-old Jeffrey Smith were murdered outside a local skating rink four years ago. This summer, 27-year-old Paul Murray was tried, convicted, and sentenced to die in the electric chair for the McCord murder. His case is being appealed, and so is Jerome Vincent Berard's case. He's the man convicted of killing the two Montgomery teenagers. The disbelief that a crime like this could occur, I mean, you hear about crime in large cities, but you don't think about crime like this in, in Montgomery. 
But it happens. It happens in all towns. And that's something that you learn after you become a victim. But now, the victims are fighting back and speaking out. They formed a new organization, which will be chartered later this month. One of the suggested names for the organization is VOCAL, Victims of Crimes and Leniency. Two major goals of the organization are to strengthen restitution laws for the victims and have crime victims notified when their assailants are being released from prison. The organization will be chartered November 15th. District Attorney Jimmy Evans says that day will be a new day for the thousands of crime victims in Alabama. Kim Davis, WSFA TV News. The Alabama Housing Finance Authority was created by the legislature to finance low-interest mortgages to some hopeful home buyers who couldn't qualify under other mortgage terms. It also spurs the ailing construction industry. The authority gets its money by floating tax-exempt bonds, then allocating that money to lending institutions. For some time, the authority has been able to secure money providing interest rates well below conventional FHA or VA interest rates. But recently, the money market for tax-free bonds has been saturated, forcing its interest rates to stabilize, while the FHA and VA rates in particular are becoming more competitive. The uh, authority has to be concerned that the existing market for FHA and VA loans may continue to fall in interest rate to a point where FHA, VA loans are offered at the same rate as an authority loan or even lower. At, at this time, uh, the authority can, can do better on its loans than a home buyer could do going out for an FHA, a VA, or a conventional loan. But that, that spread, that relationship may not hold true uh, three or six months from now. FHA and VA interest rates are currently fluctuating around 12.5%. The current tax-free bond market is creating home interest rates between 11 and 11.5%. There is mixed opinion about whether that's a competitive rate, so the authority voted to make between 50 and 100 million dollars available, even though lenders say there is a demand for as much as 155 million dollars. The exact amount and the associated interest rate of the sale won't be nailed down until the bonds are sold. That's expected to take place early next week. Prospective home buyers must meet certain guidelines on income and previous home ownership, and there are restrictions on the size home that can be built. Chris Grimshaw, WSFA TV News. The multi-million dollar verdict came after 11 days of testimony and approximately four hours of deliberation by the jury. Circuit Judge Sam Taylor read the juror's decision. We, the jury, find for the plaintiff and against all of the defendants and assess plaintiff's damages at $25 million. Got to Jury do foreman Eddie Price the says the verdict was meant to send a message to society. state officials. And I think that it was just the consensus of the jury that we had to send the message to the lawmakers that they have got to do something in order to keep these kind of people away from our communities. But defense attorney Joe Carpenter system. says the case isn't over and, yet. Uh, although a terrible tragedy has occurred, I don't think it's fair for society to dump it all on those people at this time. So uh, there's no question about it. We feel like that uh, uh, there's some error in the record and uh, that a case of this magnitude certainly would need to be uh, appealed throughout the entire process. And the attorneys for Mrs. Hicks were obviously pleased with the verdict, and when asked for a one-word reaction to the jury's action, gave the courageous, appropriate justice. And in reaction, Mrs. Hicks was low-key, right but thankful. I feel good. I really do. Did you have any doubt that they would rule in your favor? No, not really. Cornhouse officials say the $25 million in damages awarded in the candidate case is the highest ever awarded in a damage suit in the state of Alabama. The last highest was $5 million rendered in the case several years ago. This is Norman Lumpkin, WSFA-TV News reporting. It will, in my opinion, uh, light the way for uh, people throughout the nation 
not only uh, uh, blacks but uh, whites as well, that by getting involved in the political process and using the, the, st the tools of politics, you can move as far as you want to go and you can make a contribution to your state and your nation that will improve the quality of life for a lot of people. Hundreds of people crowded into the Macon County Courthouse to say goodbye to Julia Wilder and Maggie Bozeman. They were joined by more than a dozen state and local government leaders who hailed the women as martyrs for black voting rights. There were many of the same faces that took part in a march across the state early this year calling for extension of the 1965 Voting Rights Act and freedom for Ms. Bozeman and Ms. Wilder. We know that God has used Maggie and Julia to remind us that his eye is on the sparrow, and we know he watches over us. The head of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Reverend Joseph Lowry, said there was good in what happened to the women. And because of Julia and Maggie, and you and millions of people across this country, his eye was on the sparrow, and our voting rights were protected and preserved and strengthened. And you and I now, must respond by saying that now that we've extended our voting rights, we must extend our voting, right? Come on. right. And both Ms. Bozeman and Ms. Wilder made it clear they won't stop speaking out for black voting rights. I would like to say and make an appeal to women, professional group, educators, the little group, the no group, the loon, the unloon, Please get involved in the political process. I learned quite a few things through it. Such as? Well, I just learned to be more determined to be able to help somebody. For now, for both women, it's back home to Pickens to County. The justice will Tom come Foreman, from WSFA TV News in Tuskegee. goodbye to the people of Macon County. State and local government leaders praised the women for what they called a selfless defense of black voting rights. While the president of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, Joseph Lowry, who marched for the women's freedom earlier this year, said there are things to be learned from the women's efforts. Shame on you, Alabama. Shame on you that you would put your great, sweet, strong mothers in prison. But God's eye was on the sparrow. And because you put them in prison, all of us are stronger today. And we're Ms. willing Bozeman to go and Ms. Wilder are making it clear they won't stop fighting for black voting rights. Well, I just learned to be more determined to be able to help somebody. Well, justice will come. In part because of your being in jail. Justice will come. And I think the nation uh, has become awakened to that fact, that justice will come from suffering. Both say the fight's not over. Tom Foreman, WSFA TV News in Tuskegee. In Atlanta, are prepared to provide all of our available resources to make the business home. You must remember that power concedes nothing without this. All right. A little over a year ago, we started, we, we applied for and were awarded. The purpose of the center primarily is to provide uh, management and technical assistance to the minority business community. Uh, in addition to that, uh, is to identify uh, opportunities in the public and private sector and to match those opportunities with our clients. And hopefully we want to, to see our, our clients uh, promoted in such a way as to basically improve their bottom line, uh, to get them sort of in the mainstream of economic activity. Not really. You know, we played well against Herschel last year. And he, I think, gained 165 yards and 
you know, that's about as good as anybody does against him. And uh, we can hold him to 165 yards this year, tickle me to death. I think the best way to stop Herschel Walker is just to keep him off the field. And he's such a great athlete and such a great runner that if you, leave, if you let him stay out there for 40 minutes out of the 60 during the game, <clears throat> he's going to get a lot of yards and he's going to score some points. And so we need to keep our defense off the field as much as we can. And, you know, another week we have to go without any turnovers. Um, how well acquainted are you by now with the wide tackle six? I'm getting fairly acquainted with it. Uh, we saw something similar to it when we played uh, Kentucky. It, it was a lot like Georgia's defense. And Coach Crows, I've been in meetings with Coach Crows since Sunday. And uh, we've gone, done a lot of board work. And I've seen, I haven't seen a lot of film, but I've seen some. And I learned a lot about it last year when we played Georgia. We got a vacancy, obviously, on the council in District 8 petition by the fact that John Stahl and the, uh, we need to have to be held to 45 days. Half of the money that uh, we lose each year on our bus system. Mm -hmm. It's the second thing. Um, uh, I, I have heard that. That's what I'm yeah. trying to say. I'm reading that man. I'll give you the, uh, all he pleases and study law books that he ought to read Saturday and Sunday or Monday, but that the election must take place on the appointed time because that's what the law says, and it, uh, uh, it is. An evening with Sugar Ray Leonard. It took place at the Baltimore Civic Center, the same place that Leonard began his professional career. It began in the parking garage. Ron Sterling of Baltimore, who's dying of cancer, made a request to meet the man of the evening. Leonard obliged. The celebrity list, both in and out of boxing, was a long one, including Wayne Newton, Marvin Hagler, and Muhammad Ali. Boxers have been known to be ugly. We are pretty. Then came time for the decision in the ring. A fight with this great man, this great champion, could be one of the greatest fights in the history of boxing. Talking about money, you talk about Fort Knox. And this is the only man that could never make that possible. Marvelous Marvin Hagler. But unfortunately, it'll never happen. Thank you and God bless you all. Thank you. They had guessed that he would retire. They had guessed that he would come back for the big purse against Marvin Hagler. They had also guessed that he would retire first and then come back for the big fight. But Sugar Ray Leonard made the decision tonight. He is quitting. He is leaving the ring. Scott Clark for NBC News in Baltimore. fine for the plaintiff and against all of the defendants and assess the plaintiff's damages at $25 million. <laughs> Signed by the woman of the jury. Ladies and gentlemen, you have spent a long, hard two weeks. More than two weeks. The jury The governor wrote dress and we anticipate that the governor will become some state senate who will, who will speak uh, toward the legislative which point up a specific problem. Uh, we spend, and I am not a reactionary to the extent, uh, must the convict be returned to the mainstream of life. A new organization uh, point out the inequities in the system and speak for. I don't know to what extent that a nonprofit organization looking and most interested in forming such an organization. They uh, ask for the assistance of this office uh, over a year ago. We have become actively in the
Mr. Broadwater says cash flow is just as big a problem in the state's general fund as proration, and the cash flow outlook isn't expected to improve until February of next year when certain taxes are paid to the state. Right now, he says all state agencies are being encouraged to put off spending until the end of the fiscal year in September or until 1984 when Mr. Broadwater thinks the revenue picture will be better. But he says these cost-cutting measures won't help Medicaid much. He says he's looking for lots of money and quickly in order for Medicaid to continue to provide services. Well, one of the things you have is, is our state insurance fund. It has some cash uh, money. And, of course, now there was legislation passed and we did get uh, $10 million from it at one time for Medicaid. And of course, we could very possibly be going back to this insurance fund for another amount of money for Medicaid at the present time because we're dealing with a very serious situation in Medicaid. Mr. Broadwater says the insurance fund transfer to Medicaid could take place within two weeks. Dennis Latham, WSFA TV News at the Capitol. To get into that. You've got a, an interesting labor force and um, resources there. You've got an enormous variety of, uh, uh, of country and uh, area to deal with. Um, you've got development things uh, already happening. This new canal project is going to be interesting, isn't it? With, uh, connecting your, your, uh, up with the Tennessee River. And, um, I, I've um, come from Huntsville, too, uh, where uh, there's a lot of high-tech industry where it's concentrated around the, uh, uh, perhaps originating from, but no longer part of the NASA. Uh, 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 it's a big place in our terms. I think you think of Alabama as just being one of the states of the Union, but you're half the size of the whole of my country. And um, uh, where your population is, what, two, three million? Ours is 55. intimidated by the ruling of the Supreme Court. Absolutely essential to the generation and distribution effort with Mr. Rip and others on several occasions. Thousands of letters and packages meant for South Alabamians aren't going any farther than the nearest Postal Service trash can. Last weekend, a fire in a mail truck, followed by a good drenching from firemen, destroyed 13 to 15,000 pieces of mail. If it is nothing but charred remains of nothing, just paper burned, uh, we'll destroy that ourselves and throw it away. But if it has any kind of value, or if it's an insert from a business uh, portfolio or forms or anything such as this, we'll send to our dead letter office in Atlanta, Georgia, for them to hold for claims or whatever. Though it may be cold comfort for some, the Postal Service has managed to save many more letters than it lost. For the past four days and nights, postal workers have been sorting through soggy mail and hunting for addresses that might get a letter back en route. Cumberworth hopes to have the job done by this weekend. Susan Silvernail, WSFA TV News. There's close to 5,000 pounds of mail here that requires special handling. Since a mail truck caught fire in Montgomery Saturday afternoon, postal workers have been working round the clock, sorting burned and wet letters and packages, and patiently trying to make out addresses or names. Postal Supervisor Tony Cumberworth is confident that about 90% of the damaged mail will wind up at the right place, but that leaves some 13 to 15,000 letters either in ashes in the trash can or headed for the dead letter office in Atlanta. The Postal Service has recovered cameras, watches, and cash, but Cumberworth says some valuables are simply gone. I had a gentleman come in my office yesterday with a check, and he said he always receives two. The other one is out there on that floor somewhere. Could we find it for him? And I told him, no, you know, there was no way we could go through to try to find one letter. But uh, if it was recoverable, he would be receiving it in the next few days. 
When it caught fire, the truck was carrying mail bags from all around the country, bound for Montgomery and all of southern Alabama. Cumberworth hopes to have all the letters that can be recovered on their way by this weekend. Susan Silvernail, WSFA TV News. I want to coach some 80 or 90 or so. If I'm doing a good job and I can get some results. But when it gets to where I make the wrong decision all the time, it's like today I'm not going out and prepared. I don't know if it's the right decision or not. I've already made it. Uh, uh, when I get to where I can't get them to play, uh, 15, 20 years ago, I'd get them to play. I didn't care who they were. I'd win at Bassett. 